me into this mystery. See, take this bread, take this wine, now the simple may divine for any to receive. By your mercy we come to your table. By your grace you are making us faithful Lord we remember you And remember us leads us to worship And as we worship you Our worship leads to communion we respond to your invitation, we remember you. See his body, his blood, know that he has overcome every trial we will To last to be saved, none too broken nor ashamed, all are welcome in this place. By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace you are making us faithful, Lord we remain. Let us to worship, and as we worship you, our worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation. We remember. Jesus come in glory Lord Jesus come in glory Dying you destroyed our death Rising you restored our life Lord Jesus come in glory Coming glory, Lord, we remember you. And remembrance leads us to worship, and as we worship you, our worship leads to communion. We respond to your invitation We respond to your invitation We remember you Hey, well, good morning, everyone. It's, um, it's good to be here and uh, good to be sharing this meeting with you. I'm not really supposed to be here. Um, Ronwen will introduce the church service very shortly. I just wanted to uh, bring you a brief word of greeting. Um, it's been a bit of a, a, a difficult week. I'll call it my turnaround week. I went very poorly on Monday and Tuesday, but um, with some amazing treatment, um, it's been a turnaround week and I was disconnected from all the tubes and so on. Um, on Thursday, uh, yesterday, and allowed out of hospital back on oral meds uh, here, here at home. So we're, uh, we're feeling pretty good and uh, hopefully back online for, for normal service, as it were, uh, from next week going on. 
Uh, the reason I wanted to grab this little bit of time at the beginning of our service is just to mention that the, um, the church, the Hope magazine is out this week. The Hope Baptist Church magazine is out this week. And um, I just wanted to commend it to you. I think uh, Ron Wenpam and the team have done a particularly uh, good job this, this week with the, uh, the Hope magazine. So please uh, do get your copy. Um, it's, it's nothing less than a thing of beauty, uh, the, the Hope magazine this week. So please do get that uh, and read it. And I also wanted to lead us in a, in a brief prayer. And I felt uh, in my heart today that we should be praying uh, for restoration, restoration. And I mean restoration in terms of us moving back into our church, in our church going forwards as we leave lockdown and as the situation with COVID-19 changes for the future, and as my own medical condition seems to be going up and down a bit as, as well. We need to be in firm prayer that Hope Baptist Church Bridge End continues to be a light for the gospel here in Bridge End, that we continue to go forwards together as an amazing team for the Lord uh, here in Bridge End. So let me just lead us in a very short prayer for that. Um, but I would really ask that we all meet together, um, meet in your homes, meet as a family each day and pray for that restoration in all its aspects over these coming days, please. Let's just pray briefly now and then I'll hand over to Ron Wen. Our loving Lord, our Heavenly Father, as we uh, look into confusing times that seem to lie ahead, when we're not quite sure what your plan is, we just pray, Lord, that you would give us a clear path, that your right time would hold us firm, that we would step out into the future, into the restoration of our work for the gospel here in Bridge End through the church, Lord, that we would go forwards together in a mighty and powerful way with you in the lead, Lord, every step of the way. So bless our efforts in restoration now, Lord, we ask in the royal name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And with that, I'll hand over to Ronwen to lead our church service. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Bow down before him, his glory proclaim. Fear not to enter his courts. In the slenderness of the poor wealth you would count as your own. Truth in its beauty and love in its tenderness these are the offerings to bring to his throne well good morning everybody it's good to be worshiping together on this sunday morning i bring you all the love and the prayers of the church family here at hope baptist church bridge end Who would have thought that technology could capture the intimacy of church family worship? Well, let me tell you that it has for us here at Hope these past weeks. Despite all the restrictions of COVID-19, we have felt that intimacy. And Robbie, our pastor, and Phil, have made that happen for us and we thank them for that. Now, our whole service this morning is centered on Robbie's needs. We certainly need that intimacy today because the past week has been a challenging one for him. He has been in hospital, but hopefully he is at home and at home or in hospital, I know that he will do his best to be joining in with us, worshipping with us today. His sermon is pre-recorded. We smile because we say, well, it's good to hear the sermon a second time round. In case he asks questions next week, because Robbie has a habit of doing that. And we try our best to answer them correctly. Last week, we were at Athens. But today, he is going to take us to Corinth. Now, we start our service with an update on the mission field. 
Hannah Lee will lead us through. She is our BMS representative here at Hope. And it'll be her farewell. She is going to leave Bridgend and start for Pastures New in London, a new career. And we wish you well, Hannah Lee. We wish you every success, happiness, and God's blessing on all that you do. Take our prayers and our love with you and our gratitude for all that you have done for Hope these past 15 years. Following uh, Hannah Lee, we will have our church choir where they just bless us every week and we look forward to hearing them leading us. Our family prayers today are taken by Val and Neil Jenkins. And a first, our reading will follow and is going to be taken by Captain Tom Hall, Helen and Robbie's son. Tom has long since embraced the essential truth that faith and love have to be expressed in action, not just in church disciplines. This has been manifested in Tom's exemplary military career. We have heard much about the boys and today we meet Tom. Who best to take our reading today? Every blessing, Tom, in all that you do. We believe you are going to live in Seattle. So I want you all, Ben, Tom, Jamie, I want you all to know with all the family that our family here at Hope will ever be your family in the Lord too. God bless. Now I ask Hannah Lee to take us through our link missionary news points. Thank you, Hannah Lee. Well, good morning, Hope family. Um, it is with with more than a than a tinge of sadness that that I bring you the, the, the BMS update this this week. Yeah, it's probably the last time I, I get to feedback to you in my role as as BMS contact person. It has been a, a great privilege to do this for the last seven years. So I haven't quite been for the for the decade that we are going to be looking at, but seven years of, of a very privileged job to, to be the link between you guys and our our missionaries all across the world. So I thought it very fitting this morning that, that we can look back at not just, you know, where we know the work of our missionaries quite well, but this um, looking back at the work of the BMS as a whole and maybe some things that, that you're not all aware of that BMS has been involved in, but we always support them. We support them generously as a church through their birthday gifts um, I know people support them um, in lieu of Christmas cards and personal giving, of course, and for campaigns. And, and it makes such a huge difference. And this is just as a way of saying thank you um, for, for your continued support. I am very grateful to be handing over this, as I say, what I've considered a very privileged job um, to the very capable hands of Ron Fairfax. And Ron, I really pray that it will be as much of a blessing to you as it has been for me these past seven years. So, yes, let's take a whistle stop tour through the past decade from 2009 to 2019. Um, and we start in 2009 um with the engage magazine for those who, of you who receive it you'll see this is looking very different and this introduced us to john and sue wilson who serve in france and they introduced us to some people who have come th to christ through their support which is wonderful um 
2010 then, we visited the, the partners Thai Karen Baptist Convention to meet some people you helped raise out of addiction. Your generous gifts were used to buy medicine for recovering addicts, as well as fertilizer, which helped give addicts and their families a way to grow food and to fight poverty. In 2011, you came with us to Peru and we showed you the village of Yukai where 350 people lost their homes and 400 farming families lost their crops after devastating flooding. But your support for these families allowed us to provide seeds for them to plant and to rebuild their lives. 2012, of course, who can forget the, the big year of the Olympics in London? And not only the Olympics, but also the very successful Paralympic Games that took place. The undefeated resource that was um, brought out that year shed light on some of the global injustices facing people with disabilities across the world. Your support also helped three Haitian athletes to compete in the Paralympics. A country that lays heavy on many of our hearts is North Korea, one of the toughest places in the world to be a Christian. We know how much our supporters want to see release and revival in this closed nation, which is why in 2013 you joined us in prayer for North Korea as part of our Project Cyrus initiative. The 2010s was a decade where the struggles of women across the world were brought to the fore, which is why we launched our Dignity Resource in 2014 to campaign against gender-based violence. Your support enabled us to equip and educate leaders and congregations across the world to handle the harmful impacts of gender-based violence. 2015 takes us to Nepal, and I don't think we will ever forget the two devastating earthquakes that struck Nepal in April and May of 2015. And of course, this was brought home to us so personally by the Douglas family who were there at the, at the time and who have shared their experiences from this disastrous time. Well, the earthquakes killed over 8,000 people and directly impacted over 8 million others. You gave over 650,000 pounds, which was the biggest relief response of the decade. And thanks to that generous giving, it, the, the BMS was able to provide trauma victims with necessary counseling and to rebuild schools destroyed by the earthquakes. In 2016, you gave to the incredible work of BMS evangelist Ben Francis, who is planting churches in some of the least evangelized communities in India. Ben's team and many other Christians living in these parts of India are faced with horrific persecution from religious extremist groups, but your support made it possible for them to continue to step out in faith. Another tragedy facing the world this decade was the Syrian refugee crisis. Um, a newly designed issue of Engage magazine in 2017 showed you some of the artwork created by Syrian refugee children that you helped to support in Lebanon. Their work might reveal the trauma they faced in their home country but your support showed them how much UK Christians care about their future by getting them back into school. We couldn't talk about 2018 without mentioning Life's First Cry. With an, an award-nominated feature video, we introduced you to Andisha, Tabin and Lala, three mothers from Afghanistan, all of whom have had to watch their children die in childbirth you enabled them to learn safe birthing practices and now they all have children who are thriving. And last but not least, in 2019 we introduced you to Innocent, the God-given boy of Gulu, Uganda. And of course again, Gulu and Uganda is very known to, well known to us thanks to the work of Tim and Linda Darby who have been there for several years and who we have close, close ties with. So Innocent has Down syndrome and his mother was told to abandon him when he was young. But she knew that he was special and now thanks to your support, he's able to attend a group with other children with Down syndrome where he can feel loved and accepted and know that he has a part in God's plan. 
So really just from the bottom of my heart and from everyone at BMS, we can just say thank you so much for your support. It means incredibly much. And, and I think this year already um, with the COVID-19 relief appeal that, is, that has been going on, I think I'm pretty sure each of our missionaries have mentioned I know definitely the Hodgkins in Chad and the Douglases in Nepal. I'm sure Tim and Linda Darby in, in Uganda. And, and I do think Jane in, in um, Mozambique. I've all mentioned that they have received money from the BMS to, in various different ways, help people during this, during this COVID crisis. So there's always a need and and BMS always try their best to, to meet the need of the most vulnerable people in, in God's name. So thank you. Thank you for your help. Thank you for your support. And please um, do continue to, to give financially, but to also carry the work in your prayers. Thank you. And let us all join together in a prayer for the work of the BMS. From Romans 12, verse 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Lord God, we pray for wisdom, safety and resilience for our mission workers serving around the world. From Mark 11, verse 24. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. We pray for encouragement for our partners around the world. We pray that lives will be transformed through their work. From Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. God, we pray for those affected by disaster and conflict today. God, we pray that you will bring peace and stability to their lives. From Matthew 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Lord, we pray for those who offer and receive training at BMS's training facility. We pray that the growth of your kingdom is served through the work that happens there. From Colossians 4, verse 2. Devote yourself to prayer. Be watchful and thankful. Lord God, we give thanks for the prayers and the generosity of our faithful supporters. We pray that you will continue to bless them. From John 10, verse 10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Lord, we pray for opportunities to share faith and for disciples to be made in places where Jesus is not yet known. From Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Lord God, we give thanks for the lives transformed by your grace throughout the previous years of the BMS strategy. And we pray for wisdom and insight as they come together to, to plan and develop the strategy for the years ahead. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
sending Jesus to die on the cross so that all who believe will have eternal life. We know we are undeserving and have all fallen short and so we come with grateful hearts in the full assurance that you forgive us our sins. Thank you Lord. We pray for our pastor Robbie. We thank you for him and for his ministry to us and his witness to so many others. We ask for a spe special blessing on him. Comfort him, strengthen him, we pray. We ask for healing for Robbie, and we pray for Helen too. Be near to her and their family at this time. We think of all those in our fellowship who are unwell or lonely. Touch them, we pray. Be close to them, particularly now when we are unable to meet together in church. Let us pause to silently name all those known to us who need God's healing power in their lives. We pray for all who have been the victims of coronavirus. We thank you for all doctors and medical staff who have worked through this pandemic. We thank you too for all key workers. We pray a safe vaccine may be found soon to eliminate this dreadful disease that has affected so many throughout our world. We pray for the leader of the Welsh Government and his colleagues and for the UK Government to have wisdom in their decision making. We thank you our young people return to school and further education. We pray for their safety and your blessing on them, Lord, as they continue their studies. We pray for our own children and families, many of whom are living away from us. Protect them, we pray, and help us to share our love for Christ with them. We pray for our own church leaders as they contemplate reopening the church buildings. We pray for a successful completion of the building works and the funds to pay for the work. We ask your blessing, Lord, on us all this coming week until we meet again. And shall we close in the words of the Lord's Prayer together? Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now today's reading will be brought to us by Robbie's son, Tom. Readings from Acts 18, verses 1 to 17. In Corinth. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. 
Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justus, a worshipper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptised. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio, a proconsul of Archaea, the Jews of Corinth, made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man they charged of persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, Settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sothenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Gallio showed no concern whatever. That's brilliant. It's, a, it's an exciting story. Another exciting story in the Acts of the uh, Apostles. And um, I'll bring the message straight away, uh, I, I think, from that now. Um, so let's just pray for a moment before we look into these things in a bit more detail. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, today we have been seeking your presence with us to give us courage, to build us up, to assure us of your presence with us. And we pray, Lord, as we look into this passage where Paul goes to Corinth, that that would be your message into our hearts this morning that, Lord, you would build us up, you would encourage us. And so, Lord, we ask that by your Spirit, you would speak into our hearts now. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, the last time we uh, gathered, we were looking at uh, Paul's solo evangelistic efforts in the prestigious city of Athens and how events there conspired to allow the Apostle a great gospel opportunity to speak to the council of the intellectual and the philosophical elites of that city in the Areopagus itself. Wow! But it seems the response at the time was actually quite modest. We were told that Dionysius and Damaris were named, but they're never mentioned again in the, old, in the whole of the New Testament. They are named along with what we're told are just a number of others, but not a great number, not many, as we hear about in other towns like Berea. Now, we can't know, but I do wonder myself if the intellectual snobbery, the arrogance, the elitism of the Athenians rather ruled in their hearts and kept them from believing Paul's radical claims of eternal life by the grace of God, through faith in Christ Jesus as the living Lord and Saviour. Well, that's as may be, but Paul has now moved on from Athens. Quite a short journey by his standards. He's now moving only about 50 miles or so, heading due west to the city of Corinth. Now, Corinth is uh, less well known to you and me in these days. But in those days, back in the first century, this was the best known of all the cities in the region, but for very different reasons. Corinth sits um, on a very narrow land isthmus that joins southern Greece from the rest of the country. It's now that isolated part of Greece to the south that nowadays is called the Peloponnesian Peninsula. A great holiday destination, I know, for many bridge-enders. 
Well, this was then known as the Achaia region. And that entire region of southern Greece would have been an island itself, but for this three and a half mile wide isthmus of land that joined it to the rest of the country. And on that isthmus was situated the city of Corinth. And it's because of its strategic location that Corinth had been developed in recent years by the Romans to have a large shipping port, actually two large shipping ports, one on the west in the Adriatic and one in the east onto the Aegean Sea. So Corinth was uh, known by some as Bimaris, meaning two seed. It had a foot in each sea, one in the Adriatic and one uh, in the Aegean to the east. So shipping, shipping that was coming from Rome, would come across the Adriatic, would harbour at the west side of Corinth. Its cargo would be taken off and it would be transferred along a, a slipway over that three and a half mile isthmus. Some of it would be stored for a time in the many warehouses and then it would go to the eastern port on the Aegean and it would be reloaded onto another vessel for onward travel across to Asia and beyond. And for shipping moving the other way, it would, of course, follow the reverse process. It would come in at the east, it would be moved across, and then reloaded into the Adriatic to go off to Rome and beyond. And that avoided the, uh, the shipping having to sail round the Cape of southern Greece, which was a very perilous journey for the small vessels that were used at that time. So Corinth, as a result, has become the trading capital of the known world. All sorts of goods and commodities of every kind would pass through Corinth. The huge population that resulted in Corinth, estimated to be three quarters of a million, which is massive uh, by scale at the time, consisted of lots of ships, crews, docks workers, entrepreneurs, wheeler dealers of every kind, many nationalities and creeds and colours. It's a very cosmopolitan city. And so if Athens, as we saw it previously, had been the intellectual capital of the world, well here Corinth was without doubt the commercial capital of the world. And of course with that went a more sordid and rather ugly side. So smuggling and general criminality was rife. People were trafficked along with the other goods. The sex trade abounded opium freely available, gangsterism and violence very common in the city. And we know that Paul, as he approached this place, was in human terms very anxious about his vulnerability as a lone Christian evangelist in this wild and dangerous city of Corinth. But once again, the good Apostle Paul hands all of his concerns over to God and relies not on his own strength but in the power of of the Holy Spirit. Paul uh, later recalled his anxieties and how he dealt with them in his later letter back to the church in Corinth some years later. Uh, so this is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 1 to 4. This is what Paul felt as he approached Corinth. He says this, when I came to you I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. With a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So he acknowledged even before he got to Corinth that the task was way beyond him in his own wisdom and his own strength. And nothing clever therefore from his lips, no talking about their immoral behaviour or the perils of worshipping that sex goddess Aphrodite as so many did in Corinth. Paul simply holds, holds on to his anchor, the anchor of his faith that keeps him from being swept away by those many dangerous currents, the anchor is expressed simply as Jesus Christ and him crucified. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, God incarnate as a man living 
amongst us and him crucified, dying on that cross to pay the ransom penalty for all human sin. But crucially, a living Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, to open heaven's eternal door for all who will believe in him. Now, I'm sure you remember by now, that's the bit that keeps getting Paul into trouble. And the part that he would be very tempted to compromise on for his own safety here in Corinth. And so he is absolutely resolved to leave all compromise out to put his fear and his trembling to one side and to know nothing else amongst them, only the truth of the gospel, and to leave the rest to the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, at first, when he arrives in Corinth, Paul is given a far softer landing than I'm sure he expected. And we're told in verses 2 and 3 how he's actually welcomed into the home of this Christian couple, Aquila and his wife Priscilla. Well, that very year, which we estimate to be AD 49, the uh, troublesome Jews of Rome had been ousted and banished from Rome. And so many of the new Christians were wrapped up in all of that and had been included by the Romans in this uh, banishment. And Aquila and Priscilla amongst them, and they'd only recently arrived in Corinth themselves and had sent up their tent-making business just a few months before Paul's arrival. And it seems they were very happy to have Paul, uh, a fellow tent maker, as a working guest. Now, I'm sure I don't have to explain that uh, these tents are not the uh, bright orange canvas variety that we see on the foothills of Mount Snowdon. But these are very substantial, heavily built nomadic homes, made with animal hide primarily and a very heavy goat hair fabric. These are the first century mobile homes and they were in great demand in Corinth with its very transitory population and a well-known annual games festival in the city as well that would bring visitors in from far and wide. So this is quite a serious enterprise. This is not uh, a garden shed kind of business. Interestingly though, to this day, where missionaries go to a place and join with and become part of that community that they serve and, and work within it, that is referred to as the tent maker's model of mission, after this very example that is given to us by Paul. Well, a trading centre like Corinth was, of course, a magnet for the Jewish entrepreneurs and their community here in Corinth had grown considerably, and there was a large and well-established synagogue. And that's where Paul begins his preaching of the gospel each Sabbath day. And it's before long, of course, uh, not long at all before the opposition begins to gather, and eventually we have a parting of the ways. We're told about that here in verse 6. It says this, When they opposed Paul, and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And that's become the standard model, hasn't it? First to the Jews, and then when they outrightly reject Paul and his message, he goes out to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. And here, interestingly, Paul doesn't have to go very far. <laughs> Rather provocatively, he goes only next door to the home of a Christian Gentile called Titius Justus. We're told about that there in verse 7. And then even more provocatively, the synagogue leader, Crispus, and his whole family come to faith in Christ as well. And they're all baptised by Paul. Wow, what a drama. You really couldn't make it up, could you? And just in case Paul is starting to get worried that his ministry is about to kind of implode, God sends him this amazing message of reassurance, which is very similar to Joshua 1 verse 9. And coincidentally, this is another verse 9. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, 
And no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So let's remember that Paul has entrusted his time in Corinth to the Holy Spirit of God. And he was determined to just stick with his anchor message of the gospel and let God do the rest. But we must assume that uh, he was at some stage having a slight wobble, a bit of a, a crisis of confidence. And here needed, so to speak, a bit of a half-time pep talk from God. Just to keep doing what he is doing, to stick with it, to stick with God's plan. And it turns out, if we look at verse 11, to be quite a long-term plan. Paul is to remain in Corinth for the next 18 months. And in that time, he's leading a very fruitful ministry. But all of it now outside of the Jewish community. Now that to the Jews is antagonism in the extreme. But here in Corinth, Paul is not going to allow these guys to run him out of town by their mob tactics. Because Paul knows that God will protect him and will keep him. But I doubt that even Paul could have anticipated the very great thing that God now does in his furtherance of the gospel, as our drama takes another twist. The Jewish religious authorities in Corinth, that is, this new synagogue leader, this chap called Sosthenes, and his immediate team, and then every other loyal Jew that they could muster, come together and have Paul arrested and have him brought before the local Roman regional, regional proconsul, this man called Gallio. They have uh, for Paul a contrived charge that Paul is preaching an illegal religion, that is one that is not recognised as legitimate by Rome. Now if found guilty, the consequences for Paul could have been very severe indeed and would certainly have ended his ministry in Corinth there and then. But it seems the Jewish hierarchy had misjudged things completely. For a start, uh, Paul had previously had a favourable hearing from at least two other Roman proconsuls. That was in Cyprus and later in Antioch. And news of that, of course, would have reached Corinth. And then in Corinth itself, away from that synagogue, Paul has actually been quite well received by the Corinthians. There's been a good response to his preaching of this simple gospel of Christ Jesus. And this Roman proconsul, Gallio, well, he's no fool either. He can see the motives of the Jewish priests, that this gospel of Christ is actually to them a threat, a threat to their self-serving hypocrisy. They're concerned only for their power and their influence within the Jewish community. And so, before this trial even gets underway, Gallio simply dismisses both the case itself and those who brought it. Listen again to what Gallio says in verse 14. If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanour or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be the judge of such things. So he drove them off. Get out! Clear the court! Paul, you are free to go. So the whole thing has backfired on the Jewish leadership. Not just a huge embarrassment to them on that day, but this ruling by a very senior Roman proconsul was to affect the Jewish opposition to the message of the gospel for the foreseeable future. Under Roman law, judicial precedent applied much as it does today in British law. So Gallius's dismissal of this case against Paul effectively passed a favourable verdict on the Christian faith. The charge that Christianity was an illegal religion is overturned, and it has now secured by the imperial policy of Rome, no less, the status of being a legitimate religion. So is this the end of persecution? Well, of course not. Uh, we know that that has never stopped down the years and centuries since. 
But there is no doubting that this is a very significant turning point in the early establishment of the Christian church. Paul remains in Corinth for the next 18 months, very secure and able to build in this great commercial centre of the Roman Empire an influence that would spread out widely, even to Rome itself. And we'll get to Rome towards the end of the Acts of the Apostles in a few weeks' time. But for now, we just marvel, marvel at the achievement of Paul his strategic vision, his ability to outwit the Jewish hierarchy. But wait, Paul did nothing clever at all. Do you remember? He he came to Corinth full of fear and of trembling, totally daunted by both the secular and the religious establishment in that ungodly place. His only weapon, his only asset, his only tactic was to preach Christ and him crucified. Nothing more. But nothing more is needed. The Holy Spirit of God takes and uses that simple but glorious truth and uses it for his will and purpose. And he'll do that still today for you and for me. We don't have to be clever about sharing our faith. We just need to know in our hearts and proclaim with confidence that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he was crucified for our sin, and that all repentant people can rise with him to everlasting life. Proclaim that truth, and God's Holy Spirit will do the rest. Now I could stop there, couldn't I? But I feel I must uh, just share in closing that rather more troubling verse 17, the last verse of our passage, where we're told that the crowd then turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him right there in front of the proconsul. Poor Sosthenes, beaten, we assume, by angry Jews who were infuriated at his failure to have Paul crushed and silenced by the Roman courts. But I'm sure we are given in this text, his quite unusual name, Sosthenes, because he will be named again in Paul's introduction to his great letter to this church in Corinth that will come some years later. I mentioned that earlier. And it's right at the introduction. So it's 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul's own introduction of himself at the beginning of the letter. And this is what he says. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. Isn't that an interesting final twist? I mean, it was remarkable that the previous synagogue leader, Crispus, had come to faith. Now it seems his successor did also. So can any of us doubt that the Holy Spirit of God can use us to call the most unlikely people to salvation? Our part, our part, just to know Christ and him crucified. Amen? Amen. And knowing Christ and him crucified is the very purpose of our now coming together to share the Lord's Supper, as we will in just a moment. But first I would like to bring us the words of another hymn. And uh, our hymn before communion that is going to be said rather than sung is number 381. And 381 is entitled, Jesus Stand Among Us. I'm grateful to Graham Kendrick for the words of this lovely song. Jesus, stand among us at the meeting of our lives. Be our sweet agreement at the meeting of our eyes. O Jesus, We love you, so we gather here. Join our hearts in unity and take away our fears. So to you we are gathering, out of each and every land, Christ, the love between us at the joining of our hands. O Jesus, we love you, and so we gather here. Join our hearts in unity and take away our fears. Jesus, stand among us at the breaking of the bread. Join us as one body 
as we worship you, our head. Oh Jesus, we love you. So we gather here. Join our hearts in unity and take away our fears. So if you um, are ready, we'll share the Lord's Supper together. Um, I have my bits ready. I hope you have some wine and some bread. It doesn't have to be wine. It can be any drink. The, the whole aim of this is for us to remember, to remember Christ and to remember his suffering at the cross. As normal, I've um, adapted our service slightly to cope with the, uh, the virtual circumstances uh, where we share the Lord's Supper. But we've done it before and it can be um, perfectly meaningful as we share this together, even though there is physical distance between us. We are united uh, in coming together in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, to share this uh, supper together. So we'll start with a prayer of confession. Let's, let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of your great mercy has promised forgiveness of all sins for all who will forgive others and with heartfelt repentance and true faith turn to you. And so, Lord, pardon and deliver us from all of our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness and bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now in just a moment of quiet, we could each just bring before the Lord those things, those aspects of our lives, those things that perhaps we've done over this past week or two that we know are not right before the Lord. Let's just bring them to him now and ask him by his spirit to work in our lives to put those things right. So let's just have that time of private personal confession now. Let us hear afresh what the Apostle John said. For God so loved this world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Hear also what the Apostle Peter said. Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. And hear what the Apostle Paul also later said. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And so, now that the supper of the Lord is spread before you, lift up your minds and hearts above all faithless fears and cares. Let this bread and this wine be to you the witnesses and signs of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. Before the throne of the Heavenly Father and the cross of the Redeemer, consecrate your lives afresh to Christian obedience and service, and pray for strength to do and to bear the holy will of God. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so I hope we will be able to share a lovely open table for the Lord's Supper this morning. It's a family meal we're sharing together, and it's open to all who know and to love the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and their Saviour. So I'll turn now to the instructions for the Lord's Supper that are given to us in Paul's letter to that very church in Corinth um, sometime later after the uh, episode that we, we looked at now. So I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So if we'd now like to um, all share the bread, and then once we've all shared the, the bread, uh, take your cup of drink, whatever it might be, and, and then we'll drink that all together in just a moment. So I'll share the bread now with, with Helen first. The body of Christ was broken for you. together to the Lord Jesus who shed blood saved us from all sin forever and for always and we just want to say Lord thank you Amen let me just bring a closing prayer after that Lord's Supper our Father of all, we give you thanks and praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your Son and you brought us home. Dying and living, you declared your love, you gave us grace, and you opened the gates of glory. May we who have shared this bread and this wine live together in the risen life of Christ. And may we remember the price that was paid for our forgiveness and always be ready to share the light of the gospel with others. And let us, Lord, with all of your children, be free. And may the whole earth live to praise your name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me close then our service with these words of benediction. May the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious to us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace.